Thank you, Joel. Well, this is the first time that Ball State and Northern Illinois are meeting this season. And Brady Selly told me that's kind of influenced his game plan for today. He said he doesn't necessarily want to use all the cards they've scouted on Northern in this first matchup if they don't have to. He trusts his team's judgment to just go out and play and then afterwards maybe make some adjustments and figure out some things they can fix for that next meeting in February. But, you know, these two teams lead the conference in scoring. And he said this is not just coach speak. He truly believes that the difference in today's game is going to be with points in the paint. Let's go to Amanda real quick. Well, Shelby, you had mentioned that Ryan Patterson said he wants Carmen Grande to drive into the basket more. Well, I talked with Brady Selly, and he told me that over the summer, he and his staff made the decision to put the ball in her hands more this season. He said he's a big trust guy, so once you can earn that with him, you're the player he wants to have control of the ball. And he said, you know, at the beginning of the season, his players would get a rebound and they would try to take the ball up themselves. Well, now they grab it and they're looking to outlet it right to Grande. They want to get it to her because they know she has the ability to get the ball right back to them, and we've been seeing that in the play she's had so far. Joel Allie Lehman, no doubt a leader on this team, and that role is actually going to help her post-graduation. She will be the first ever NIU student athlete to graduate ROTC, and after this year, she will be active duty in the U.S. Army for four years. Now, she grew up near a training base for the Indiana National Guard, so there was a strong military presence in her community, and she said when military recruiters came to her high school, she was the one doing pull-ups in a dress. How have the Cardinals adjusted to life without Natalie Fontaine? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that at the beginning of the season, they were still trying to figure out. And I've had conversations with Brady Sully about at the beginning of the year, them still figuring out player rotations. How do we play without our star? But they're 25 games in now. They're 10 and three in the conference. They can play without her. They've proven it in the success that they're having. And you know, they've had different people on the team step up and kind of take over that role that Natalie Fontaine played. And so going off of that, one of the players that has stepped up has been Renee Bennett. How yeah. has she been such a reliable force for Brady Salee this season? Yeah, well, I think that Renee Bennett is such an interesting player because you look at where she started her college career to where she is now. She is the go-to person on this team. And, you know, Brady Salee even said that last year she kind of took a back seat to Renee Bennett, or <laughs> excuse me, Natalie Fontaine, because that was her role, you know, and she was okay with that but it's her senior season. She averages now 16 points a game. In the past two games, she's had back-to-back double-doubles. She's someone that we just, how we're talking about, she's stepped up and she's proven to be a leader on this team. Yeah, and you can talk about the, the quote-unquote big three of uh, Mon Mon Mariah Monaco, Renee Bennett, and Jill Morrison, but who might be a player that we would consider under the radar right now for Ball State? I am going to go with Morgan Glachek because she's just a freshman. So she's not putting in a great amount of time. She's 6'5", so she plays the same position as Renee Bennett. But she gives her that opportunity to come out of the game, give her a little break. And when, you know, Gladchek is in there, it's not like the offense or defense is crumbling. She can hold her own. And, you know, I remember specifically in uh, a game against Akron, Renee Bennett got into some foul trouble early in the first half. And so Morgan Gladchek was able to come in. And she played a good amount of time for the Cardinals. And Brady Sally was really impressed with her performance. So I think that you know, over the next few years as we see her develop, she's going to be one of those players how we're talking about in Natalie Fontaine and Renee Bennett. The Cardinals are back here in Worthen Arena tonight after that road loss against Akron on a last second shot by Isaiah Johnson. Now I talked with Ball State's Ryan Weber about the quick turnaround and he said after Wednesday's loss, James Whitford told the team, we're not talking about it. We don't have time to get emotional. We have to let it go, move on and focus on Ohio. Good evening, everybody. Well, it's not every day that college student athletes get to learn from former pros, but what's even more rare is when one coaches you during the prime of their career. Ball State soccer players are going to get that chance, though, this season. Indy 11 soccer standout Eamon Zayad is joining the Cardinals staff as an assistant coach. This is his second season with the Indy 11 after leading them to win the league's spring championship in 2016. Now, Ball State head coach Craig Roberts said that Zayad is going to be of particular help to the team's forwards with insight to finishing techniques, but Zayad himself says he's here for two reasons. One, to learn and enhance his own coaching here in America, having been from Ireland, and two, give the Cardinals some insight having played the game for 16 years in various parts of the world. 
Now to high school baseball, Delta hosting Yorktown in a doubleheader today. In the bottom of the first half, Delta's Tanner Lambert whiffs off the pitch, but it rolls past the catcher and Adam Haynes comes flying in. Little contact right there, but he scores. Now later in the second, two on base, Adam Haynes hits a line drive. First runner scores easily, but check this out. Aiden Hins does his best little running back impression as he dodges for the tag. Delta scores and they lead 3-0 after two, but Yorktown came back. The Tigers win game one 12-9. Well, just 10 minutes away from Ball State's campus, a high school teacher is helping to educate athletic trainers in the community. Tyler Walker has the story. Welcome on back into NASCAR Race Hub. Let's take a look at the chase standings. Now, all the guys in yellow have won at least one race this season. Kyle Larson right there on the edge in 16th. And that could make this next page a little messy. Now on the left, that's the current next 12, but on the right, we've thrown Chris Buescher into the mix. Now, there's the asterisk next to him because he doesn't exactly have the amount of points he needs right now to make it into the top 30. Yeah, he, right, Adam? yeah, he's got to be top 30 in points. He's three behind David Reagan. So we put the asterisk there. But but what you see, once you add him to the mix, if he gets in the top 30 in points, he takes over that 12th position, becoming the 12th winner. And, and look what that does to the guy you talked about, Kyle Larson now on the outside well, looking in. That's immediately where my, uh, my eyes go when I look at this. If I'm the 42 team, how concerned am I right now? Very high level of concern. And, and, and here's my opinion. What they need to do to feel comfortable, they need to win. And, and I think when you look at the tracks coming up, Bristol's been a really good venue for him. Michigan International Speedway, where he had a top five earlier this year. They could take all the pressure off by winning one of these next two races for sure. If he stays in, is he championship material to you? Or do you see any other guy on this board that that you think could win the title? Well, I think Chris Buescher is going to have a hard time. I, I think, you know, their their version of the championship is just making it into the chase. That that team is not where they need to be to go out and win a title. But when you look at Chase Elliott, the, the, the runs that he had midseason, he certainly could do some things to put himself in championship position. And I really think Kyle Larson, despite the fact that, that they may not make it in, if they can get in playing with no pressure, I think he's got a legitimate shot to make a run through the playoffs. Okay, well, let's get into our social garage now. The little Leo Gordon turned to six yesterday. Jeff's son celebrating with nothing other than a donut cake. And Adam, you brought you brought in donuts this morning. Yeah, and you know what? His father, Jeff, spends a lot of time with us on the road. He doesn't eat donuts. I can't believe father got son a donut for his birthday. No, he's a health nut, that Jeff How does Jeff that make Gordon. any sense? <laughs> <laughs> so let's introduce you for the first time to the third member of our crew and say hey to Amanda Smith. This is a guy that leads his team in assists, steals, blocks, offensive rebounds, and scoring. Now, knowing that, James Whitford said he's the type of player you have to defend at all levels because there's not one specific area of the game where he stands out. He can drive to the rim, he can shoot threes, and he has the ability to make plays for his team. Now, he told me he defines him as an elite playmaker, passer, and defender, and he said that tonight he's looking for his team in Ball State to make Miami play on the glass, grabbing offensive rebounds, but not giving up second chance shots on the other end. Well, James Whitford had told me that in practice, they've really been focusing on adjusting to all the different defenses Miami has. He said it's all about taking care of the ball, telling me they've prepared in practice by going through drills that force the guys to make the right reads. And by doing that, he said, hopefully they're gonna turn over the ball less. But so far we've seen a lot of fast breaking by Ball State with Miami turning over the ball. Yeah, Dan, we saw Marcus Weathers grabbing at his eye when we, he went down on that last play. Well, the athletic trainer ran over. It ended up being his contact fell out, so he ran over back to the bench, put some solution on it. It's back in his eye, and we see him back in the game. Let's introduce you to the third member of broadcast crew and Amanda Smith, who's down on the sidelines. Thank you, Tyler. Well, Ball State assistant coach Ryan Patterson said they are going to have to compete for 40 minutes today because Akron's play style is fast and precise. They sprint up and down the floor, and he said that the Cardinals aren't going to be able to celebrate after made baskets or sleep on plays. They're going to have to get back on defense because if they don't, it's going to be a long day of easy layups and wide open threes for the zip. So we can expect to see a pretty up-tempo game today, Tyler, knowing that's been Akron's sort of style now for the past six years. Tyler Ball State with the lead right now, but Ryan Patterson telling me they need to do a better job of getting out on shooters and not allowing them to drive into the lane. Now we saw Renee Bennett on the bench for most of the first half, 
and that's something that Ball State thought that they were going to be able to use to their advantage. She's got four inches on Akron's tallest player, so he said hopefully having her back in the second, they'll be able to feed it into her some more and get some momentum going. Come up, Tyler, we've seen Renee Bennett go up with that little jumper from the block over and over again here in the second half after not playing much in the first. Now, Brady Salih told me he's so proud of her because this game didn't always come easy. He told me coming out of high school, she battled confidence issues with her ability to play at this level, and he said, you know, looking at her, she's perfect for this sport, but it took her a little bit to see that in herself. Now, I asked him where he thought that sort of confidence has come from, and he told me just by practicing day in and day out, proving to herself that she can compete with the best of them, it's continued to rise. Coach, you had told me you didn't know if you guys would win today without a big game from Renee Bennett. We didn't see many minutes from her in the first half, so how were you able to adjust your game plan? Well, you know, she got in foul trouble. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's all her fault or not. I'll have to watch it on film, but, uh, you know, Morgan Glatchett came in and gave us a huge lift there in the first half and played really well. Um, you know, Franny, I thought, came in. Destiny came in, played well. Jill hit some threes, so we did it a little bit different. Clearly, Carmen played well. Um, but, you know, when, when, you're, when your dog gets in foul trouble and goes out, somebody's got to step up, and we definitely stepped up today. You know, having her back in the third and fourth quarter, what sort of spark was she able to give you guys that allowed you to pull away with the win? Well, you, you could see they had a chance uh, to either let her lay it up or foul her, and they chose to foul her. You know, we got them in foul trouble and just kept feeding her, feeding her, feeding her, and they couldn't really do a whole lot with her in there. And, you know, we made enough free throws and enough plays uh, down the stretch. You know, again, Mo hit a huge shot, uh, a, a three, when they kind of hunkered down in there and loosened them up a little bit. And that's what you got to do. You got to play from the inside out, and I thought we executed that pretty well today. Thank you, Coach. Congrats right, on the win. You. Well, Jimmy Johnson was able to break a six-race streak of failing to finish in the top 10 this past weekend in Indy. The 48 team placed third, locking themselves into the chase. But it's a different story for Johnson's teammate, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Now, obviously, he is still not running due to concussion-like symptoms. So you've got four-time cup champ Jeff Gordon, who comes into the brickyard, places 13th, and that knocks Junior out of the chase. So the question now isn't just when or even if Dale Junior will return, but can the 88 car make up those lost points and jump back up in the chase standings? Their next shot will be with Gordon back in the car this weekend at Pocono Raceway. Two back-to-back -back top 10 finishes for Jamie McMurray. He placed seventh at Kentucky and sixth this past weekend in New Hampshire. Now with that finish, he was able to jump ahead of Dale Jr. in the chase standings to 14th. Dale Jr. obviously not running right now due to concussion-like symptoms, so the one team being able to take advantage of him being out of the car. Now, McMurray has yet to win a Sprint Cup Series race this year, but Indy could be his track. 2015 was a struggle for Roush Fenway Racing. Greg Biffle, Ricky Stenhouse, and Trevor Bain all failed to make the chase. But this past weekend in Daytona, all three found themselves finishing in the top 10. Now, that being said, there are only five chase spots left up for grabs. So the big question is whether or not one or two or even all three of the Roush Fenway drivers can land one of those spots. Their next shot will be this weekend in Kentucky. 